Okay, so we are going to talk about more metagenomes, but instead of just looking at taxonomy and organisms, we're going to venture into a new area, right? I mean, you've been talking about OTUs and species and strains and genera and all that fun stuff, but who likes taxonomy? That's right. <laughs> Nobody does. Oh, come on. <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about uh, what, we're, what I'm calling functional annotation, um, and I'll go into more detail about that. So the uh, learning objectives for this uh, half of the day is to be able to determine what really I'm talking about between taxonomy composition versus functional composition, what, what the heck I'm talking about. Uh, have a general understanding of some of the different functional or protein databases out there. Understand the pros and cons of uh, assembly in metagenomics and also for gene calling. I'm going to try to address both of those and we can probably have a conversation around that a bit. This is heavily uh, my opinion already now. Um, and then uh, be able to actually functionally annotate your metagenome using a tool called Humong, which I'm going to be covering today. Um, and also you're going to be using Stamp again in the lab, which obviously you already got introduced to. So you should be pros and you'll see how it can also be used with functional features as opposed to uh, organism features. Okay. So, uh, taxonomy composition really answers the question that we already talked about. It's sort of who is there, what are the organisms there? Whereas functional composition really answers sort of what are they doing? Um, and it looks at the different genes and the different database, the different uh, protein coding genes within the whole metagenome as a community. Uh, and obviously metagenomes, the word metagenome comes from multiple genomes coming together in a community, right? So that's the same sort of information you would get from a genome annotation project where you figure out if your genome of interest is photosynthesizing or fixing nitrogen or metabolizing antibiotics. Um, but instead we're looking at this at the community level and we're asking, you know, how much potential does this community have to do these type of functions? It's really the, the interesting biological questions and how do we get there, of course. Okay, and so what do we mean by function, right? So in really general sense, we could be talking about really general categories like photosynthesis, nitrogen metabolism, sort of glycolysis, things that are just sort of generally thrown out there. It's not very precise. Or we could really be talking about specific groups of orthologs, right? Like particular gene families, right? So we could be talking about a particular nitrogen fixation gene called H. We could be talking about maybe in EC uh, number, which is just a different type of classification for enzymes. Uh, one of my favorite alcohol dehydrogens, which gets a lot of peace in my body sometimes. <laughs> and uh, every talk should have at least one alcohol. Yeah. So, okay. And or um, uh, or this could be a different database, and this is a particular K ortholog within the K database that we're going to talk about quite in more detail. So this is just an identifier for a particular gene family. This one represents uh, a butyrate kinase, right? So those are very specific functional um, sort of features. Or we can collapse them into more general features and talk about that. And we're sort of going to see how those play together. Okay, so if you thought that there was lots of taxonomy databases and tools, the list of protein uh, databases is uh, very large as well. And so we can talk about these in a little bit more detail. I sort of listed the ones that I thought were most relevant or, or popular or in between those. Uh, so we'll just walk through those, these fairly quickly. Has everyone heard of the COG before? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so the COG database is kind of one of the older ones around. You'll see it sometimes described in papers and people will color their, their genes or something by COG categories and it was first put out by NCBI and it stands for Clusters of Orthologous Genes. And it's really well known, and it's still uh, still used where people map genes sometimes to it because it's just has nice sort of general categories like unknown. <laughs> uh, I think there's pathogenicity factors maybe, um, but some it's a nice little hierarchy. It, it works fairly well. The actual COG database hasn't been updated since 2003, so it works as sort of a hierarchy. But obviously, no one's putting new genes into this on a sort of regular basis, so. People sometimes uh, map to it. It's okay. I would write it off though, as you shouldn't do that. 
Okay, um, the next is the C database, which is used by RAST and MGRAST. So MGRAST is obviously the server we've talked about a couple times, and RAST is the genomics only version. So if you're annotating genomes, there's a tool called RAST, which came out way before metagenomes, metagenomics, and before MGRAST. Uh, the C database basically is a, is a system to annotate proteins using these um, seed subsystems, and they have their own system for mapping genes to these things, and they relate them together in a hierarchical structure. I'm not going to go into super detail about any of these as you can tell. So PFAM is more focused on protein domains. They do have some full-length feature uh, proteins, but it tends to be more focused on smaller proteins. Uh, that's the PFAM. The EGNOR database, which is kind of related to COG originally, but it's very comprehensive. I think it's still being updated. It's an automated method for clustering proteins into groups and sort of keeping those updated. It's one of the larger ones out there of the 190,000 different protein families. The UNIREF um, is put out by Unifront, which I think Rob and maybe someone else mentioned the other day. Um, the UNIREF basically clusters their proteins down into different levels, and this is quite useful, and I think it will be more useful in the future, but they have UNIREF 100, which just basically means if two sequences are 100% identical between them, they get collapsed into one family, right? So they're all unique. UNREF 90 means that at the 90% uh, identity that they collapse anything within 90% uh, of it to each other. So it's a less comprehensive database at that point. And then they have a UNREF 50 where they collapse anything within 50% identity to each other. The nice thing about this database is they actually link these guys to organisms and then link um, from here to, to the other clusters as well. It's automated. Uh, it's put out by whoever runs Uniprot, it's at UBI, I guess. Anyway, they have lots of money, so that's good, so it keeps on going. Um, that's that. Keg, uh, has anyone heard of Keg before? It's very well known, very widely well known. Uh, it's very popular. Um, each entry is sort of really well annotated, and I think what made the Keg really popular was its manual creation, but also the ability to put these Keg words logs into a metabolic network, and then even associate nice images with that, right? So you've probably seen a paper before, even if you don't know what the keg is. A nice metabolic um, a metabolic image with maybe certain genes highlighted in those pathways. Uh, so that's the keg. We are going to be using the keg sort of in our lab, uh, in, this, in the lab associated with this lecture. Um, it did go private, it's quite a few years ago now, I want to say four, four years maybe? Who knows? Um, so it used to be completely open, and then they close it, and you need a license to get the full sort of download. But you can still use the website for a lot of things, and you can um, still search the tools, but it's not sort of being updated for public use as much. So there's some movement away from it, but it's still, at this point, I would say, one of the, the most well-known things. Um, it's still well-used, I would say, in the original. Um, and then there's Metasite. Uh, which has been around as well, and it's starting to become more popular, and I would say maybe it'll start to replace keg in the future. The keg is, uh, contains microbes and humans, and I would say there's maybe not enough microbe focus in the, in the keg, whereas Metaspike is a microbe-focused database, and I, I think has a better uh, handle on a lot of the different functions within microbes. That being said, I've tried to use Metaspike several times, and each time I end up banging my head against the table a few times. I think it's slowly getting better. I think they're realizing they need to sort of show people how things are done. <laughs> um, if anyone has any, does anyone have any impression about any of these tools? Who likes Metasite? Anybody use Metasite? I think you might have said that you do. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's good. Right. <laughs> and, uh, um, this is interesting with peripheral, but there's a version, a clone of Metasite actually running off of the University of Minnesota that is biodegradation centric. So it's actually xenobiotic pathways, but they've also put in a reaction to the care module in there. That's sort of the direction they're going. So, but I don't know if anyone's tried to pipe that into annotation right. as an application. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in general, there's lots of different sort of functional databases or protein databases. They all have different pros and cons. Uh, I'm going to focus on Keg and sort of walk through that just to 
to give you a sense of how these things tend to be organized, but obviously they're all a bit different, and things change in the future as always. Okay, so we're going to do a few slides on K just to get you up to date of how things relate to each other. Otherwise, to make sort of any biological inference is pretty tough. So um, we will focus on using the K database during this workshop. Um, and at one level, there's what's called K orthologs. So these are sort of the most basic uh, clustering of genes. And so within this uh, are the most specific. So within a K ortholog, these are thought to be homologs. Anybody want to give me a homolog definition? Why not? I'm a phylogenetist. Anybody know what a homolog is? Come on. Same gene. What's that? <coughs> Same gene? Same ancestor. Common share the common ancestor. Share common ancestor between the genes. Anybody want to say different to that? Only once? Only twice? Sold. Yes. So uh, any any two genes that have a common ancestor or ancestry related phylogenetically would be classified as homolog. Um, and orthologs are, are genes within different species that are ancestry related to that species. Anyway, uh, that was a little tangent. But so these genes are thought to be homologs or orthologs, uh, and because of that, they tend to be thought to have the same function. Right. So these genes are really thought that if this gene is identified to this ortholog, it's really doing the same uh, same function, the same reaction. Um, in the KNIC database, there's roughly 12,000 KOs in the database. Um, that number might actually be higher. I'm not sure where I pulled that number. It might be more like 15,000. But we're still talking not in the number eggnog had like 190,000. So we're, we're at magnitude lower than this. The nice thing about this is that the K organizes these KOs, these K orthologs, into what's called KEG modules and KEG pathways. And so if you pull up a, 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 a sort of a card from the database of a particular K log, in this case you get the identifier for this guy, sorry, and K log can be mapped to one or many pathways. So you see the pathway that's linked to. It's also linked to modules. I'm just going to talk about what these two are in more detail. But you also see, associate some of these things to uh, different types of hierarchies and even if you were doing human stuff or human genetics, which we're not. Uh, certain diseases. Okay, so keg modules are mainly defined functional units. This is kind of what keg calls them. They're small groups of KOs that tend to function together to do something. These are really clear terms. Uh, there's 750 different keg modules, but the idea is that they they all have a kind of they have a one sort of function. What's neat about keg modules is, so this is an entry for M0002, which is uh, the four module involving the three carbon compounds involved in glycolysis. And then it has a list of uh, KO identifiers. I'm sorry, this is a bit small. Can people see these? I mean, you don't have to see the numbers, but you can see that there's different keg orthologs making into it. And then they have this figure. So what's kind of neat about modules is that to get from here to here, um, it has different options, right? So Different KOs can do the same function as well. So we have this uh, KO here at the first, and it's indicated by here. And then what's neat is that you can either have this KO or this KO to complete the reaction. And they have a definition for what completes a module. So it's not just having all of the KOs. You don't necessarily need all of them. You just need either this one or this one to get to this step. Or uh, plus this. This and then you get to this step, and then you can have one of these guys, and then you get to this step, and then you can have one of these guys down here to complete the module. And so, if you had some mixture of these KOs, and that module would be considered covered, and it would form a complete module. I'm just telling you this so that you can understand where they're going from this. And the tool that you're going to be using sort of does this coverage for you and calculates if a module is fulfilled or not. It's not just looking. There's enough KOs in the in the general cluster. Yeah, there's a question back here. Yes. Uh, will you repeat for the circumference per line the K LMM two hundred eighty nine? It's so this sort of a, a different pathway. Or it's, a, it's no. This is this is like one pathway, um, but showing you different options for completing that part of the pathway is what's showing. Uh, um, 
for one means the uh, right? Yes. Yes. So this means you need this for sure, okay. and then you need one of these two. And the other notation they use is like the graphical form of it, which is nice to look at. And then they use these parentheses over here, which is actually what is meant by the, by the computer algorithm to say, so we need this one, we need one of these guys plus one of these, is that what I said? Yes. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Is it that that big one? I think it's either, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. You can either have this, yeah. So it's this big one will complete the pathway. Or you can do this, and to fill this pathway, you can have one of these. So, a little more complicated. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, and then the last one is the keg keg modules. And then keg pathways are even larger. They're sort of large, nicely things we like to put a name on, but they're not really cohesive units. So keg pathways groups uh, keg with logs into larger pathways. There's approximately 230 in the keg hit database. The nice thing about pathways is that each pathway has a graphical map within the database, so you get these really nice images, which are usually clear and you can see them better. <laughs> and then there's, uh, you can highlight particular genes within a, well, in a, within a pathway, but they're, they tend to be very large. Um, pathways can be collapsed in a more general term sometimes, but those terms are usually not super useful, things like amino acid metabolism or carbohydrate metabolism. But if you look at metagenomic papers, sometimes you'll see just people saying, yes, we saw you know, carbohydrate metabolism increased in the gut compared to the skin. <clears throat> HMP paper, nature. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay, so those are sort of the protein databases. Do we have any more questions about databases? Because now I'm going to move into sort of systems that use them. Is there a database that I haven't mentioned that is your favorite? And you're like, why didn't you mention? KZ, yeah, KZ. Anything else? Everyone's happy with that? Oh, everyone's super sleepy after Subway, I can tell. Okay, so uh, so metagenomic annotation systems. This is like how we did classification for taxonomy, but we're using functions. So again, there's web-based methods. Uh, and I've listed three different methods here, so we've already heard of MG RAS. I don't know if IMG slash M has been mentioned. This is put out by the JGI. I don't really know. So this used to be a sort of semi-open resource where you put your data up and then maybe give it back. Now it requires a login, and I'm not really sure the system about if anybody can get a login or you have to be within a club. So does anybody know about JGI and the IMG? Looking at people in the back. Anybody can get a login? Yeah. And everybody can load their data up and get it back? So Yep. It's really easy to use. And what about using their actual pipeline, or is that only for JGI metagenome to sequence? That's the impression I got. They have Say what? I think they have, it's more of their own. Their own, right? So if you're, if you're the G, JGI umbrella, then you have metagenome to write through the pipeline. But those are all off CBW stream. That's good to know. Uh, EBI has a metagenomic server as well. This one is public as far as I know. Um, this is sort of relatively new from one of the bigger centers, and I don't know a lot of that as well. But if you're into sort of a, I'm going to throw my data in the pipeline and see what comes out the other end, I think it's, it's worth a look at for sure. Uh, this morning I mentioned some local GUI based ones, so where you're actually installed on your local computer. Uh, Megan, we talked about already. But this does, Megan does functional annotation as well, as, opposed, as, a, as well as the taxonomy. Clover, um, I almost didn't put this in here, is a virtual machine based uh, method. So you boot it up and it has its own little Linux server that runs on your laptop. It contains a nice standard operating procedure and sort of how to go through it. It hasn't been super maintained as far as I can tell. Uh, and the last person I talked to said it was a pain in the butt to use. But that goes along with most Python tools. So. Yeah. I'm putting it here as something you may want to look at if you're looking for sort of a graphical interface. Okay, and then the more nitty gritty local based stuff, which we're obviously tailored towards more here at CBW because 
That's where all the cool kids hang out. So local base, um, I listed uh, Metamos, which is a really hands-on if you really want to play with different settings. It's a pipeline tool that starts with you know filtering the raw reads, does assembly, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. If you like to do assembly, it keeps track of where those reads map in the assembly. Can annotate using different methods. They kind of put different options in for annotation to different databases. So we're talking lots of variables here. Um, and give you lots of different outputs. The problem with a tool like this, you're thinking, why don't people just make tools that like lets you do everything at once? The problem is that it's hard to maintain and that usually it's fairly buggy. So I've I've attempted to use this a few times and I could never really successfully get from one end to the other. Again, that was a little while ago, it might have improved, but if you're really into like uh, genome assembly or metagenomic assembly and you want to tackle it, I would start at Metamos. I think it's I think it's a good uh, spot that includes different types of genome assembly for metagenomics. Very popular in sort of the functional space is do-it-yourself, so people just make their own pipelines, um, and I, I think that's actually very, very popular. So for taxonomy assignment, yeah, people have kind of like different methods, but for functional assignment, a lot of people end up just taking their database that they're interested in, their Uniprod or their their tank database, they run their own blast, whatever it's the thing they do, they take the top hit, bam, it's done. Is that not as good as some of these other methods? I don't, if you look at what we're gonna talk about next, it's Humon, you'll see it's sort of the extra few steps they do, um, and then you gotta ask yourself, is that worth, um, is that a lot better than if I just did a single blast and then took the top hit? Um, usually I would think yes, because anything where you do it yourself, you introduce bugs, and weird results. And then also I found that if you just do your own thing, it's hard for reviewers to really tell if you're doing the right thing sometimes. So using sort of a standard uh, pipeline is sometimes the way to go. Okay. So. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't include the citation of Humon. Sorry about that. So uh, again, Humon was used by the Human Microbiome Project. Obviously, it was used on humans. <laughs> it's been applied to lots of other samples, so you shouldn't feel like you can't find it on your soil samples or your ocean samples. It's based on the keg database right now on the back end, so uh, you shouldn't feel shunned if you have other samples that aren't human based. That's what I'm trying to get across. Um, and there's a very large uh, pipeline here, and I'm going to walk us through each step. It's going to get maybe a little more technical than we did this morning, but I think it's worth trying to show you some of the things it's trying to do in the background besides just taking the top here. Okay, so um, the first step is that we have short DNA sequence reads. We do some QC uh, steps. They tend to remove human DNA uh, beforehand. Mm, have we talked at all about human contamination besides the fact that it happens? You talked about it, Will? Everyone else says no, and Will goes yes. So. <laughs> um, Okay, so unfortunately, I don't cover it in the lab, but I will mention it now. So obviously with metagenomic data, you did all the DNA, right? And so you can get contamination, contamination, say, from humans or from other species you're not interested in, right? So if we had human samples, we might not want to characterize the functions within the human DNA, right? So typically what people will do is they'll use bow tie and they'll map any of these reads against the human genome first. If you had a mouse, they would use the mouse uh, genome. If you were doing squid, you would use the squid genome or whatever you like, right? And that just filters those reads out so that you're not functionally annotating something that's not really in the microbiome. It's just it's essentially contamination. Um, and that stuff's pretty straightforward. Just using GoTai, anything that hits the genome is screened out at this step. All right, so the next step is a translated blast against the functional database. In this, type, in this case, it's the keg ontology. So this first step is the translated blast. So um, before we get there, people have used blast before, right? Does everyone know what blast P is? Protein query, it's a protein database. Does anybody know what blast X is? Nucleotide to protein, perfect. So 
the idea here is that we're translating the nucleotide sequence into six frames, right? Three, four, three reverse, taking each of those translations and then doing a blast against the protein database. So that's what we're doing at this step. So initially, um, blasting uh, against the database, which in this case I think is in the range of 20 to 30,000 sequences. And then if you have, no, no, sorry, it's in the hundreds of thousand sequences, gene sequences. And then if you have a, a MySeq run of 25 million reads, that's a lot of comparisons, right? Blast is not going to finish in any time, anytime soon on a normal server. So this is when uh, some neurosearch tools came out. This is pulled from the paper called uh, Diamond. So before there was BlastX, then there was a tool called RAP Search, and then RAP Search 2, which was uh, fairly fast. So this is meant for doing translated protein database uh, searches. If you block out these right now and just look at these are the speed up. So on the y-axis, you have the number of times faster these tools are compared to BLAST. Okay? So BLAST axis is at the bottom of one. RAP Search is in blue here. So that was about 100 times faster, I believe. Diamond came out and sort of blew it out of the water at 20,000 times faster, supposedly, on some of these data sets. Um, they have a fast setting and a sensitive setting, so the fast setting is significantly faster, 20,000, whereas the sensitive setting, you're back down to 2,500 times faster. Um, so what this allows is really fast searches. Um, they show some accuracy here, but it's also been tested with some colleagues of mine that basically anything below 80%, you really lose sensitivity. So with BLAST, you can reliably find proteins that are 40% identical very well. Whereas Diamond would just fall apart. It wouldn't do a very good job. It, would, it wouldn't return you back the same results as BLAST would. Over 80, 90% for sure, Diamond's going to give you the same top hit that BLAST would. So you're sacrificing, obviously, accuracy, but it's more for the more distant proteins. And since you're sacrificing that sensitivity, you get mass speed ups. So uh, a search that takes about a minute for diamond would take about 14 days for blast. Yeah. It's not actually, is it, they claim on the paper 20,000 times, but in reality, when you do, the strategy we used was we try to use like BWA. Uh -huh. Aside any taxonomy we found, then anything we missed, we give to blast X. Then I, if you know anything with that passes, you we fit you know iterative blast in the try blast side, like uh, uh, just continue blast X, blast. Then anything missed at the end go to blast X. Right. So I replied to this Gavin, if the number of read is very small. Diamond is extremely strong than last X. So it's it's really context based. So for large sample, probably Gavin may work fine. But if, if it's a smaller sample, you know, the indexing takes a longer time. Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. so if you yeah. if you did like a single, like if you did ten query sequences, hundred query sequences. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's gonna take longer. Yeah. If you run a large uh, number of reads through it, yeah. you get the speed up. So. Yeah. So I think Diamond's awesome. I think it's it's a useful tool because it allows things like this to happen faster. Uh, as with anything, there's small drawbacks. But, um, yes. But even if it's only 10,000 times faster, that's still minutes within you know, same days, which is impressive. Okay. So we're going to be using Diamond in the lab later today. Uh, it's basically, the nice thing about it is it's a, it's a simple replacement. So the same sort of command you would use with BlastX and the same sort of output. You just put diamond in there, a little bit of change in the options, but the output looks identical. So it's kind of nice as a substitute in many different pipelines where you have blast X or wrap search to these methods and sort of made their output identical so that you can then use the same later pipelines. Okay, so the first step is is that uh, translated blast. Okay, we're going to use diamond in our in our case. Then you get this raw blasted table and tab builder tab delimited format that's then given to these, these steps. So the next step is to, to weight those hits. So what happens is you have your blast hits, these blast results coming out, right? 
And so you have these blast results, and then the idea is to weight the higher bit score by a larger weight. And so what you do is you take the relative abundance of each KO, so you don't just count each hit within that as one, you weight that one by the uh, inverse p value of that value. Why do they use the inverse of the p value? They said it didn't really matter too much. They tried they tried e value, they tried bit score, they tried identity. They said they all sort of gave similar results, but they went with the inverse of the p value. So it just means the the more significant the p value, the larger the weight is for that for that hit. So that means that if a sequence hits something, not all hits are straight they're, they're weighted by their significance. Um, the other big step here is that they're normalized by the average length of the Kegel's log. So you can imagine if you have really big proteins, the chance of hitting a larger protein is more than hitting a really small protein. And so to account for that difference, they look at the average length of the large of each group of proteins, and they they normalize by that length so that the little proteins don't get unrepresented in your functional database. Make sense so far? Fairly logical, right? Okay. The next step they do is they uh, use what uh, was already published called MinPath. Uh, where did my text go? Where did it go? Is there anything on your Slides? Yeah, yeah. That's it? Okay. I must have all this animation on here. Okay, so I'll go back in a second. So the idea here is that you're trying to reduce the number of spurious false positive pathways. So what happens, as I already mentioned, is each of these K orthologs can be mapped to one or many K pathways, right? Because they're, they do different things in different systems. And since you have a hit to a K ortholog, it doesn't really necessarily mean that every one of those pathways that it was in found in is, is going to actually be in the community, right? And the idea is that if you had a pathway that had, say, 20 different KOs, so different steps along the, along the pathway, but only two of those KOs are observed in the community, you're not going to want to count that pathway as actually being present in the sample. And so MinPath, uh, embedded within this human tool, tries to um, minimize the number of pathways based on that information. So it says, these KOs are here. They cover most of this pathway over here. So we're going to say that they're mostly in that pathway. And these ones that are you know, not above some mean level are not going to be counted as pathways so that there's less false positives. Okay. OK, the next stop is this taxonomic limitation. I really like how they got this picture of the dog. It should have been a horse, actually, for my stuff. But, um, so uh, again, this is to reduce the number of false positive steps, and also the normalized by KO. This stuff's a little sketchy, to be honest. Um, but what they do is they look at the genes, the K genes that you found that line up with your metagenome, and they ask um, if the organism that that gene was in, if that makes sense. So if you had dog in an ocean, or you have um, other odd information, it asks if that really is there, and if that gene should really be called within that organism. This makes sense if you're talking about you know, dogs and cats. Not so much when there's particular bacteria, right? So k Boyd's law has been assigned to this bacterial group. You know, should you really say that, since you don't see it from your k Boyd's law, that that's really not there? I don't, I don't think so, but this plays a fairly minor role in the, in the normalization step. So anyway, the main goal here is that pathways are not found in any of the observed organisms and are made up mostly of KOs mapping to a different pathway group. So they try to remove pathways where they don't think the organism actually exists within the, within the uh, community. Okay, and then lastly, they try to do some normalization because sometimes k logs appear in copy number within a genome. And then if they, uh, they try to actually estimate the copy number within that genome, and they divide by that genes. Again, the step's a little sketchy. So this means if you had three of the same gene in that genome, 
they would divide your hits by three for this uh, for this gene to attempt to normalize for it. Okay, and then the last step is sort of um, the opposite problem where they haven't estimated enough KOs. Sometimes they account for the fact that metagenome sequencing is not saturate usually the full sequencing depth, and so it's understandable that there could be missing KOs just because you haven't sequenced enough, right? So we can't cover the whole genome sometimes. And so if there's um, some KOs with really small abundances, even though the rest of the pathway seems to be as abundant, they'll actually increase the relative abundance of those KOs within that pathway to complete the pathway. Okay, that's the last step of the crazy pipeline. So, the question is, is, you know, maybe could you just take the top hidden, would it matter? I don't really know. <laughs> uh, but we'll use, this, we'll use this pipeline because it gives us the output we want, and it does several things that do make sense. Okay, so out of this pipeline, you get two major types of information. You get um, module information and pathway information, and you get what's called coverage, which is basically absent or presence in that community. So if a module is present, it's been found to be completed, that's just a one or a zero. That information doesn't really make a lot of sense for me because this is over a whole entire community. The more interesting stuff is the pathway abundance, so the relative abundance of that pathway. And so this is an actual number that's, sorry, that uh, tells you the relative abundance of that pathway or module, which you can then compare across different samples. Okay. Any questions about QMON? Yep. That step where it increases the relative abundance if it feels that it's low, don't you think that's a huge assumption? I don't know if I like that. <laughs> it's okay. It makes me uneasy. Yeah, I think there's several steps in here that make people uneasy. Um, the only thing I can say is slightly in defense, and so yes, I agree. It, it feels weird to arbitrarily increase the level of these low KOs to the to median level of the rest of the pathway when just because they think that's what you need. Mm -hmm. um, the only small defense in their factor is that they did test most of these things to see if it improved their accuracy on an uh, actual data set, right? So they did, a, they did a simulated data set and they asked what happens if we do sampling and we sometimes miss KOs and, and they did it on a mock community as well with actual where they knew the genomes and they sequenced them and then they knew what pathways were on those. And so all these things were sort of tested against that to sort of optimize the accuracy of that. So there must be, I would hope, some truth to it. But I agree that I think what you do have to take into account a little bit, though, is that the numbers that are coming out of these are relative abundances. You'll see that they're really small, so that these sum up to 1 across a whole sample. So you get, you know, 0. 0.0003 or 0. 0.1 to the minus 6 or something, right? Which it's fine, it's relative abundance, but that doesn't equate any way to number of reads within that pathway, right? I mean, you've seen how it's divided by the length of the gene, it's been scaled by MinPath, it's been, it's been messed around with here. So it, the number doesn't equate in any way to the proportion of actual reads mapping directly to that number. It's their estimate of what really is the functional capability of that sample based on the reads mapping. It's a distinction, but I think it, I think it makes you, you have to sort of keep track of it. Yeah, yep. I agree. So it's sort of metagenomic reconstruction as much as it's defining what you have. Yeah, I, I think what happens is if you want to talk about pathways or modules, you have to you have to figure out some way to count these things, right? So if you have a pathway with ten genes in it, and you have you know five reads mapping to this KO and five reads mapping to this KO within this pathway, what number do you put on that pathway? Is it 10? Because there's five and five, but you really don't have any of the other KOs of the thing? Like, so I kind of understand what they're trying to do, but it's also, you know, as a biologist, it's kind of scary when they're doing the steps of, of altering the numbers slightly, right? Yes, so I agree it's sort of reconstruction. Okay. I mostly bring out the steps so that you think about some of the big ones that people tend to do are really the gene normalization, the gene length, which makes sense that you don't want to arbitrarily 
because of the sequences, you have less chance of hitting certain genes. I think that one makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe the gene size and things like that, but some of these other ones are a little, a little wishy-washy. I'm not a huge confidence gainer for a tool you're going to use, right, and learn. But anyway, that's what we're going to do. Okay. On to other controversial things. Okay, so what about assembly? So for people that don't know what assembly is, assembly is often used in genomics to obviously join raw reads into contigs, which are continuous pieces of DNA, and then those contigs get put into scaffolds, which are uh, chunks of contigs that have been joined together, sometimes with gaps. So obviously we have DNA fragmented, you find overlaps between the reads, and we can do this because we have good read depth, 10 or 20 times over the same region, so we know that these things fit together. And then we assemble these overlaps into contigs using nice fancy algorithms and the room graphs. And then we assemble these contigs in a scaffold. And this is how it works for a genome. The problem is, is what happens now when these aren't all from the same organism and you throw a genome assembly tool at it? Right? And once you see the massive problem with this, you assemble things together that really weren't in the same genome. The assembler has no idea that the reads don't come from the same genome. It's just trying to join things together. Okay, so let's go through some of the pros and cons, and people can weigh in on if they agree or not. I'll take opinions from the back as well. Okay, so pros for assembly. One, and this was actually one of the major reasons why people used to do assembly, was it actually helps with computation time. So if you collapse these reads down into sort of one instance, that similarity search, back when you used to have to use BLAST anyway, is much faster because now instead of doing you know the, the 40 or 50 or 1,000 reads that match the same gene, you're only doing that sequence similarity once. And so people used to do assembly just to speed up that process. Assembly takes time as well uh, and memory, but before diamond, I mean, you couldn't really do blasting 25 million reads against 100,000 read database. So it was used for that for that reason sometimes. Um, the other reason why is that reads used to be shorter, so they used to be 50 base pairs or 75 base pairs. And when you're doing a translated blast, that gets divided by three, and now you're trying to find sequence similarity based on 20 to 25 nucleotides long, right? That might not be really a long enough protein sequence to really say that this came from this gene in that way, right? So that's a fairly short sequence. As reads get longer now, that problem goes away. If we're at 300 base pairs, that's 100. Uh, 100 amino acid search, and that, that's a lot better as well now. And this is the biggie. So the biggest pro right now, I would say, is that people are using them to reconstruct genomes, which I really mentioned briefly this morning. It's the idea that if you can do assembly, then you can say that these contigs, or these, at least these large pieces of DNA, really do belong from the same genome. And that's really interesting, because then you can start to say, for this organism that we've never cultured, and maybe it looks really cool, we can say, ooh, it's doing this, this, and this, and this. Caveats to that is that those things might not be really real. Right? We don't know for sure that those reads always came together, or you could be clapping different strains into a single genome. Right? So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But that being said, there was a paper published very recently showing new genomes that were found from a new phylum potentially, uh, and they used genome reconstruction using assembly to say what they think is odd about these genomes. Interesting paper. And I think it's really, it's hard to say at this point whether there could be false thoughts or not. But maybe new sequencing down the road where we actually do have longer reads, we can actually test these assemblies to see if they really are collapsing things from different strains, different isolates together. Okay, so those are the pros. Uh, cons are a bit longer here, but let's see. So obviously this is what I just sort of said, that reads are not all from the same genome, so chimeras can form. Basically genes, reads that don't belong together are put together. You have to keep in mind that when you're doing this genome assembly, that read depth is often not as deep as in genomics, where we sequence to 20 or 30 times. We don't have that sequencing depth a lot of times for many genomes. So the genome assembly tools could be um, limited in really their power anyway. I got organism diversity can cause something to fail. So this has been shown a little bit in, in this recent paper as well, where you have, if you have hundreds of thousands of different things in your community. An assembly program just can't handle that very well. If you subsample down, 
to the point where maybe you only have 10 or 20 different things in your sample, or maybe you had a low complex, a low diversity sample to begin with, then metagenome assembly might work better. If you only have three or four organisms, there's a good chance you can reconstruct those genomes very well because there's not enough diversity. Thousands of genomes, tens of thousands, it's going to get harder also from sequencing. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is kind of a little minor point, but sometimes when people are doing this to save computational time, they were doing assembly, and then they were calculating, you know, how many genes were found in this assembly, and that's what they were putting as their relative abundance. But you have to take into account that it's collapsed all these reads, and so you lose that information. Metamos does a really good job, that's that pipeline that actually keeps track of those reads from before, and then maps them back and adds the counts for the reads going back into those contexts. So it's just something you have to be aware of, but it's an extra step if you do use assembly. Uh, and then the last really big kind of thing that often people don't maybe think about enough is that they do do assembly for whatever reason, it can really bias your results on what you're saying functionally. So if the idea is to functionally say what your community is doing, and you want to say this community or this sample has you know, two times more ability to um, break down this sugar, right? That if you do assembly first, you're really biasing because you could have some bias where you tend to only annotate, you only have to assemble those organisms that do that process anyway. And you might not annotate maybe the small reads that didn't go into that assembly and that, that worked. So what do you do with all those reads that failed the assembly? Do you try to annotate those separately or do you just leave those off to the side and only fun functionally annotate the assembly part? So if you're trying to just look at global coverage, the assembly part might be hard. But is it useful? Absolutely, for doing genome reconstruction and for trying to link things together. You just have to keep in mind that it's not. It, I would say that if you can avoid assembly for what you're doing, it, it might be better. Any thoughts on this? Couldn't you augment it by doing some qPCR as well? Yeah. And even some walking, so inverse PCR from the pieces that you're putting together to code. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what's probably needed if you're gonna if you're gonna claim some new genome. And I can't. I haven't read that paper in detail. I think they did do some qPCR to see if, if it really was from the same genome. Um, yes. <laughs> yep. Is there also the possibility of cross validating your assembly result with brand new records? Coming together the same leads. I, I don't understand what you mean, sorry. You, you know how there's something like Munger, which is basically assigning reads to, to a, a genome. It's basically a magic thing. And I know MDRAS does have some very terrible fragment recruiting module. Okay, right. Yeah. Where well, you're assigning reads, individual reads, to a yeah. genome, or, your, or your, in this case, your assembly yeah. genome, right? And you, you want to use that as a test of how well. Yeah, you can, but I mean, I don't think it's going to tell you for sure that you, so you can look at read depth, and it is what you're at, right? So if you have a, a contig, and then you have three times as much reads mapping to this section of the contig, and only and half as many, or a third less over here, then that suggests maybe it's not really together. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think some people that do assembly of genomes have attempted to do that. I can't say anymore. Yeah, John. Can you give us an idea of what the depth of your information No. <laughs> what do you mean, sorry? I mean, how, how prevalent it is when these genome yeah, assemblies occur? I, mean, I, I don't think there's been a great estimate. So the people that are doing genome reconstruction, I think they their goal is to get longer and longer contigs. And I think they do sometimes do in silico stuff to make sure they're not getting chimeras. But I, I, I think what's not appreciated is that at any level, you're getting chimeras, right? So if you have any sort of strain variation, the assembler's going to collapse those together, right? Especially if they're in equal populations. So I don't have a good sense of how problematic it is. Besides that, it worries me. Yeah, Rob. Well, Can't hear you. <clears throat> if you've got lots of strain of diversity, obviously it's going to be a huge concern. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, <clears throat> so Elizabeth Edwards U of T had a PhD student who was dealing with this mixed community of fairly simple community included, I'm 
make up the names of characters, like Halo actors. This is something they found after something happened or whatever. Uh, and there are two very similar strains. And those are interesting stats. And they did sort of the meta genome. What was the tool? Trinity. Trinity, yes. Right. Yeah, so it's very dependent, obviously, on the number of things in your sample and about what your outcome is. I think it's worth it if you understand that you're really trying to reconstruct something and you have to check for these chimeras, right? And then you have to double check by private recruitment and, and going through that process. Is it worth it? Absolutely. When, when you can't culture something and you think you have something really cool you want to describe, I think it's worth going after. It's a standard sort of step in a functional annotation pipeline like this, I'm, I'm not as huge a fan on it because I think it introduces a lot of biases. Okay. Uh, next little thing is what about gene calling? So normal, uh, this comes from genomics as well. So usually when we annotate a genome, we assemble first and then we do gene calling where we try to predict the start and stop site of a particular gene. And when metagenomics first came out, assembly was really big and gene calling was really big. And um, I would say gene calling in metagenomics is almost dead and I don't see too many people still doing it. But uh, we'll walk through the pros and cons anyway. So um, the idea here is that the pros of doing some type of gene calling on your metagenome by itself is that you may result in less false positives from sort of annotating non-real genes, right? So with BLASTX, you're just basically translating in six frames. Some of those might not be real genes anyway, and then you're trying to associate some function to a piece of DNA that's not really a gene in the first place. Um, and then another pro is that it basically lowers the number of annotation comparisons later on, right? So instead of doing all your reads, then you're only annotating the things that were actually called a gene in the first place. And again, it comes back to that approach where last was slow and you want to try to limit the number of comparisons you're making at that point. Um, cons is that there's no sort of good learning data set. So for a lot of gene prediction programs, they, they base the prediction on similar genomes where they know the composition and also the um, features of, of genes and how they're called in, in related organisms. You don't really have that training data set for a, a community because it's a community of genes, and so that really doesn't really work very well. Um, these raw reads will not really cover entire genes, so in genome assembly, you actually have full genes start to finish anyway. But these reads, if they're 100 or 200 base pairs, you know, you can have any words where you don't have the start, you don't have the end, you don't have either of those. Um, or a mixture, and so does it really make sense to try to annotate something that's a gene when you only have a partial read anyway? Uh, it does usually often require assemble data, so when people are doing, the, most people that do gene calling on metagenomic data, is they've assembled it in the first place, and then they've sort of gone down the genome pipeline. There are particular tools meant for metagenome assembly, metagenome gene calling. There's frag gene scan and metagene annotator and some of the other, other traditional sort of gene callers have added on sort of metagenome option. Uh, so they are out there. It's just that uh, people tend to just do a BLASTX. They just do a six frame translation and then do the search directly without the gene calling first. Okay, any questions about that? Great. Okay, community function potential. This is my sort of thing like this morning where I said we shouldn't call things as absolute abundance, it's relative abundance. This is my little pet peeve about, actually it's not my pet peeve, I often get this from a lot of people, so I, I'm pushing it back on you so you, you know what people are talking about. So when we do metagenomics, we're not doing metatranscriptomics, that's what John's going to talk about tomorrow, and we're not doing metaproteomics, right? We're getting the sequence of the actual gene. And so to say that this community is functionally doing this compared to this other 
community is not really true. It's the potential, right? Because we don't know if this community with their genes are actually transcribing those genes. We don't know that those genes are entering into proteins. The same with genomics. It's the same argument with genomes versus transcriptomes versus proteomics, right? So within the microbial community, it could be that, yes, this community might have double the number of dysfunction, but we don't know for sure that that community is actually transcribing and using those genes. So we, have, we just have to be careful to remember that it is sort of the potential, and it's not a for sure thing unless you do some follow-up in the transcriptomics or you have metabolomics to actually back up that stance, that that community is really doing it. It's the potential that they have. That being said, microbes tend to be fairly thrifty. And that, and they change over time fairly quickly. So I feel fairly common saying that when you do see these changes in gene relative abundances, that it probably suggests that functionally they are doing those things, but you just can't claim it. It's, it's just suggestive. It's not for sure real. Does that? I'm trying to get that point across. Does that come across clear? Okay. Good. Okay. So that's the last of my sort of. I don't know what I call it, biological slides. There's a couple things that I want to cover now at the end as sort of a wrap-up and also sort of advertisement and sort of information. Thing. Okay, first is microbiome helper. So this is my sort of GitHub repository where I just throw scripts in there that I find useful for my own stuff. It's a, uh, it's a site that has a few things. It has helpful scripts that combine different tools. You've used a couple of them in the lab already, and you're going to use a couple more of them in the lab coming up. It's on a GitHub site. Um, the nice thing about it is that we sort of update it whenever we need to change things or tools change because it's what we use in the lab. Um, and the other nice part of it is that there's a standard operating procedure. So for 16S and for metagenomics, uh, what we use in our lab, we sort of have step by step the steps we run on the data from start to finish. And that changes over time as tools change. Um, but it's there, so if you're looking for sort of, ooh, I wonder what you know, Morgan is using in his lab lately. Or if you're looking for a guide, you can use those scripts, download the, the tools that those scripts wrap, and then it, it sort of processes the data, the data in automatic fashion. So uh, it's a small sort of semi-advertisement for that. Um, this is meant as an overview slide. So I, the take-home message here is, if you haven't already realized this, is that there's common formats or conceptual ideas here. And this can help if you haven't grasped this already. So yesterday you heard a lot about 16S RNA DNA and the fact that we get these what's called OT tables. Um, and we were doing that with Chai and her mother. And what happens is we get this table and it can be in different file formats, but the whole idea is that we have different counts of these OTUs, right, across different samples. And so this just means that this OTU is twice in this sample, right? Very, fairly simple. The same thing happens when we use um, Metaflam, which we did this morning, right? We didn't get OTUs, but we actually get the names of the things, right? We get the genus or species or the biome level of those same counts. We get to the same sort of table format. Today, this afternoon, we're going to be doing the same thing, but now instead of OTUs, we're actually getting K orthologs, which we can then collapse into modules and pathways. That's the same sort of data. And what's cool is um, we've used STAMP this morning, or we've used STAMP the same way, we sort of do the same sort of plots, the same sort of ideas. It's just conceptually nice to understand this data, once you get to this format, is essentially the same. PyCrest, uh, which I might talk about in just a minute, actually takes this type of information, this O2 table, and it predicts what you would get if you had the metagenome for the same sample, without doing the sequencing. Uh, and I might talk about that in a minute, about how it works. But the idea is then you can get a, a predicted metagenome and then do the same sort of comparison of, of what might be significant in that sample. All right, infomercial's almost over. Um, I do want to mention this mostly because uh, people go back to where they're coming from. So here at Dalhousie, we recently started what's called the Integrated Microbiome Resource. It's sort of based out of my lab, but it has many collaborators on it. Um, we're offering it sort of as a resource. So we offer sort of sequencing abilities, but also the bioinformatics along with it. So that if you ever, the idea is of course you go back and you'll be wizards and you'll just do your own microbiome analysis and you'll help out all your friends. But if not, and you get sick of it, and you just want to send you know, samples to us, uh, for a tidy fee, we can do the sequencing and the bioinformatics for you and pass you back the results, either in stamp files or uh, OTU tables or nice visualization. 
Uh, we obviously didn't talk about wet lab too much because this is a bioinformatics workshop and I'm not a huge wet lab expert at all. Uh, so far from the IMR, we've developed this nice sort of 16S Amplicon uh, workflow. Uh, if you have more questions about this, I think you can talk to Andre, who's in the back corner. He's actually taking the workshop, but he sort of developed it. Um, the cool thing is that we're doing um, uh, this is for the aluminum I seek, and so we have the single PCR step where we have the barcodes as well as the sequencer adapters all together. Um, and then he's doing verification of this on a little e gel. Uh, and then there's normalization to account for the different amounts of DNA between the samples. And we've been using aluminum I seek uh, in the Tupper building uh, where we're using 300 and 300 base pairs, and we get overlaps for the 16S. We're also getting a aluminum next seek. Uh, hopefully next spring, uh, which is next door to the Tupper, and we're hoping to do metagenomic sequencing for a decent cost, because right now it's kind of expensive on the high seek, which is $300, $400 a sample maybe, $600, oh. $600, and I think with the next seek they'll drop, drop metagenomic sequencing back down to in the $100 range, I'm hoping, but we'll see. Okay, uh, and then lastly is my last slide. And also sort of an overview, hopefully by the end of this, you'll see that how these major tools sort of work together in a large workflow where we have our sequencing, we do quality control, paradigm stitching, you can use chime for 16S data or metaflan on human, which you're going to talk about in this dimension of data, how these go into obviously different visualizations, tools like STAMP. This wasn't covered in this workshop, it was developed here at Dialog, so we went to it in. And there's uh, novel stuff in the future. Just meant to be an overview of the past two days, so hopefully things are st you're starting to understand where things fit together in the large scheme of things. Okay, so that's it. <coughs> Do we have any questions on any of that so far? Okay, so we have two options. One, we can do a coffee break and then lab, or two, I can go over the pie crust uh, lecture right now. How are people feel? I got about five to six slides. Yeah, do it with the pie crust now, get all done with. She decided, it's her fault. <laughs> Yay, pie crust. So I can take questions in detail about this. Uh, so this is what I just showed a few minutes ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, pie crust stands for phylogenetic investigation of communities by reconstruction of unnecessary states. I have to put that up there because I have to remember it. Uh, it's hosted at a GitHub website that was published in 2013 in Nature Biotechnology, and it was a large collaboration um, between Curtis Hunthauer, Rod Deco, and Rob Knight with an API at the time. I was a postdoc in Rob's lab at the time, um, and some of these people I've still not met, but we've had so many phone calls, it's, it's kind of silly actually, right? So, mm -hmm. so the idea behind pie crust is, so I showed you what it does, but how does it sort of work? So before we get here, the idea is when we need to put names on a species, an O2, right? We did this O2 cluster, and then we assign taxonomy to it. Well, why do we do that? Why do we put names to O2s, do you think? Why don't we don't just treat them as O2s? We could do PCA plots. Yeah? Physiological and physiological context is often traditionally assigned by Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and someone copy that and I'll just yeah. shoot them <laughs> Yes, absolutely, right? So we associate names to particular functions or ecological context, right? So we already do this, but that's, that's why we put names on things, because we think we know something about when we say uh, E. coli, oh, that's not a really good example, but when we say anything about organisms, we think we know something about that, right? We think they're spore forming, or we think they know where they are, or where they shouldn't be. Uh, things like that. So the idea behind pie crust is really to do that in some sort of quantitative way, to say, knowing that we have these organisms in the sample, what can we tell say about what functions we think those are doing in the sample? So the way that we do that is we have a 16S reference tree. In this case, we usually use the green genes tree, so it's fairly large. It has uh, both tips with sequences that are reference genomes, where we actually sequence the genome, but many, many more tips where we just have 16S sequences from the environment, right? And the whole idea with reference O2 picking is where we take some 16S sequence or we associate with the tip of the tree. We say that this sequence matches best to this tip of the tree, right? 
And now we know information about how this, this tip relates to the rest of the tree. That was not informative. Okay. So if we zoom in a little bit to this one sampled spot, the way PyCrusher works is that we take information about neighboring genomes. So in this case, we have really good sampling coverage. This is not normally how it works. But for these red guys, we have, we have, a, we have a genome sequence there. It's an enlarged 13,000. How many genomes are in the NCBI? 13,000? 12,000? Depending if you include draft or not. And for a particular um, gene, I'm interested in a particular keg ortholog, where you copy down how many times we see that keg ortholog in that genome, right? So this genome has its keg ortholog twice. This one has it once, this one has it once, this one has it four times, this one's had once, once. Some of these might have it none. These are tests where we don't have any information, they're just environmental samples. And the idea is that if we have this guy, we want to ask what do we think is the copy number of this, this stuff right here. And so the way we do this is we go to the ancestor, and then we use phylogenetic ancestral state reconstruction, which attempts to figure out, based on this information, also the rest of the tree, what the copy number is of this gene, at what it was at this ancestor, right? And so well, this has a one, so it has a use parsimony, but there's maximum likelihood numbers up there as well, to try to predict the copy number here. And these numbers will spit out a continuous variable, so we'll often get a, obviously you can't have a point two a gene, but we keep it as a decimal, so it's, in a community it sort of goes away. And then uh, we'll often get an estimate too of what the error looks like, so we'll look at a plus or minus. And then we make some type of inference down the leaf here to this tip, and we predict what we think is the copy number of this gene, and our error bars Okay, so that's how it works for a single gene for a single tip. Okay, so then we have to repeat that now for say the 8,000 tip orthologs. So we do that now for each gene family, and that's for the same thing. And then once we do this, we actually have a predicted genome at this point. So we, have, we think of, you know, of, of the cake orthologs, we have a prediction of what cake orthologs would be in this tip, this genome. But then we want to have it pre-calculated now for all the other tips in the tree. So we actually repeat that and we um, pre-calculate this for all the tips at the 97% O2 level within the green leaves tree. So we repeat that. So that's for about 100,000 tips. That all goes into a little file. And then when you bring your genome along, your metagenome, sorry, we do this a uh, couple of cool steps. The first is we do we take your O2 table. And we can actually sort of correct for 16S copy numbers. This is besides functional prediction. So the idea here is that some genes, sorry, some organisms have a different copy number of 16S, right? So some have three, some have two. Most of the time people just ignore that, right? So what happens is you have three 16S copy genes and you sequence it, that organism has a bias of appearing three times more in your sample. Whoa. Um, so there's no, there wasn't a great, there was a couple of patients that came out right before ours actually that attempted to normalize as well. And so what we do is we actually estimate this as a 16S copy number, just like we did the other traits. And we divide this numbers uh, into here, right? So with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 2, we have a copy number of 5. So we actually normalize this guy so that there's actually only 2 and 1. And so that's where we get our numbers here, right? So we've actually corrected for the 16S copy number. So now we have what we call a corrected OQ table or a normalized OQ table for 6S copy number. And then you can actually do all your stuff with this afterwards. Turns out it doesn't have a huge impact on things. Of course, people that write the papers say it does. Uh, it sometimes does, but you know, if you look at a PCRA plot, it might not have a huge effect. Um, but if you're looking at particular abundances of different organisms, it can affect things. So you can take this and, and use what you want with it. And then the next step is sort of where the magic happens, where we um, take now the keg predictions. We have 8,000 different keg or flaw predictions. And we do matrix multiplication to say the fact that we have two of these OQs in our sample and we have four uh, of this keg ortholog, right? Then we would predict that this keg ortholog is at least eight times in the metagenome contributed to by this one guy. So that would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick example. So, let's say we have, um, uh, sorry, because each IQ is going to contribute most to that K-Boy right? 
So if we had this this type of log where there's four uh, four copies of it in this O2, <laughs> and we had it only occurring once in sample three, then we would expect four of K002 in sample three. Okay, that makes sense. So it's matrix multiplication where we just add up basically the contribution of each keyboard log for each word. Okay? And then we have a predicted metagenome. And then you can do what you like with it after. So that's how PyQuest basically works. I did not include any extra slides about validation or things like that. Um, you can read the paper, of course. I didn't really want to get into super detail. I just wanted to fundamentally understand how it worked. Um, we basically tested it on human microbiome uh, samples, but we also did, um, <sighs> sorry, we did soil samples, we did hypersaline mats, oh, and we did animals, yes, in general. They were like zoo animals. So in general, what happens, the big question is, is how accurate is pie crust? The accuracy of pie crust depends a lot on how good we have reference genomes for the bugs uh, from that community. So if you go sample, um, in the outer atmosphere where we don't have a great representation of organisms, that's not the greatest example, maybe deep sea, um, then pie crust wouldn't do as well, right? So it, it matters a lot of how many genomes we have, how many reference genomes. Uh, but for human microbiome project, we, we were in the range of 90% accuracy. So, and we could actually recapitulate some of the same biological findings from, uh, from real metagenomic samples. So we did paired samples where we took 16S data predicted the metagenome, and we compared those against the real metagenomic data from those same samples. That's how we did the validation. Okay, so that's the bonus lecture on PyCrest. This has, uh, it's just sort of a workflow. It doesn't really matter, but you can get these O2 tables either through a Chime PyCrest code reference, or if you're using Mother, there's a main file format that should also make a PyCrest compatible O2 table. And then that's most of the tables you can use these IDs that we then run through the copy number and the predictive number genome. You know, and we can collapse those K org logs into modules and pathways, which then is like used uh, for statuses or visualization. Okay, any questions about PyCrest?